Do you want, you're just waiting for a speaker. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, no, fair I'm, enough. I thought someone was going to have a question. We will, but actually, before you guys, yeah. before you, there's a couple of you speaking. Do you mind just speaking with me? Yes, it's Howard Michelson, and with me is uh, Mr. Joel Weitzel, and uh, Matt McNeil from the Association of Beverage Licensees is with us as well. Uh, so, obviously, uh, uh, we're still digesting the decision. Uh, uh, we're, we're pleased with the result on behalf of our clients and, and various organizations that were interested uh, uh, in the matter before the court. Uh, I think that what his, Lord, what his Lordship has done is important in terms of speaking of, of the balance, which is that I don't think anybody in this province has a, 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 any a problem with very strong impaired driving laws. It, 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 it creates a terrible scourge on our roads. and. The objective here was never to hinder, uh, uh, to, to create safety on the roads. The issue here was to find a balance which, on, which allows the citizens the corresponding rights in the process to respond to uh, uh, being, uh, uh, being issued one of these uh, uh, prohibitions. And the problem is, is that with the legislation, was that the legislation has as its objective uh, taking impaired drivers off the road, but it doesn't. But it prohibits the citizen from saying, "But I wasn't impaired." So the very goal it was, it was uh, designed to achieve swept up within it not just the guilty, but the innocent. And the innocent, the citizens of the province, had no ability to push back and say, "Well, actually, I'm not someone doing wrong by this legislation. I wasn't impaired." And one of the concerns, uh, of course, for the citizens that we uh, uh, argued in court is that there's a number of ways in which innocent people, this isn't some sort of lawyer's technical argument, there are a number of very practical ways in which um, innocent people can be caught up in the snare of these process with no ability then uh, uh, to establish their innocence or, or to have their innocence determined. Uh, uh, for example, uh, under the criminal law regime, and Mr. Weitzel can speak to this if, if you have any questions, when someone is taken to the police station and a breath demand is made, there's a very rigorous protocol to make sure that when a person is, is breathing into that, doing a, providing a breath sample, that um, the officer watches to make sure that there's no burping or any sort of contamination of mouth alcohol that may create a false reading. That doesn't happen uh, under this process. So that's one of the flaws. The other flaw is you could have uh, a husband and wife out for dinner that are law-abiding citizens and, 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 and the husband has said, I'll be the designated driver tonight. And at the end of the meal, the wife, uh, who's had a few drinks, says, you know, this wine is so lovely, I'd like to get a bottle of it and, and we can buy it and enjoy it at home, and asks her husband to have a sip of that wine. He has that. He's not impaired. He gets in his car. Three minutes later, he gets pulled over and asked to blow into a screening device. He may blow a fail, but wasn't impaired and was acting properly. And, and then there's no ability under this legislation then to say, but look, I wasn't impaired. My wife will give evidence, the restaurant will give evidence, and under the current regime, the delegate that makes the decision has no ability except to plug their ears and say, I'm sorry, you blew a fail, and that's all that matters. And the problem then is you're not in a system or a regime which is dealing with impaired driving. It, you're, you're into something else where innocent people are being caught up in the, in the snare and the dragnet uh, of the regime. So again, the issue isn't with impaired driving and strong impaired driving laws. The issue is with the process by which this regime was designed. It seems like a key thing that the judge was considering was how onerous the penalties are for people who don't have the benefit of Can you speak to that? Yes. Um, one of the things that the uh, government uh, uh, emphasized when they brought this legislation in is that they had the toughest uh, drinking and driving laws in Canada, and there were very significant um, uh, financial penalties, I think, which was concerning to the court in, in a practical sense. The penalty itself was 500 but there was other penalties that in total exceeded $4,000. But the other concern is that in addition to having to take a driving responsible test, you also had to have an interlock device in your car for a year. And when you go back to the example I gave about the husband and wife, until this regime came in, the only people that would have to have an interlock device in their car were the worst of the worst, the people that were deserving uh, 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 of, of uh, the strong condemnation of society. Now you could be somebody who wasn't even impaired, who was acting reasonably, 
uh, who could be caught in this snare, have no ability to defend themselves, and then be driving in a carpool and having to be identified amongst their work mates as someone who's the worst of the worst. You know, oh my gosh, you're that person? I didn't know that. And yet you were a law-abiding citizen who was taking the impaired driving laws seriously. So I think it was the stigma of part of it, it was the cause of part of it, where his lordship, I think, concluded that this was a result that was approximating, essentially, a conviction of a crime. So in a